Okay, this is episode four of Debugging with Chrome DevTools. And in this episode, we're going to focus on the Network tab. Uh, I'll try and keep this as brief as I can. Unfortunately, well, fortunately, I should say, there is so much you can do with the Network tab, so much you can tell about your website and its performance and issues you can find. It might be a little long, but I'll try and keep it brief uh, by cutting down on some of this waffling. Anyway, so we're going to analyze one of the Elementor pages that's got a lot of bits and pieces of content on it. So I've gone to the Elementor page uh, for designers, for web designers. Now, I've brought this up in uh, PageSpeed Insights. And for our mobile, it tells us we've got a performance of 20. For our desktop, it tells us that we've got a performance of 89. And look, Elementor certainly could do some things to improve this. Uh, but look, at the end of the day, what I want to look at is what is worth worrying about. Now, my personal feeling is that these numbers are meaningless. They're an emulator run from a server in the US. They don't take into account what real users are experiencing. I think that this has gone beyond its use by date. It may show you some bits and pieces in here that you could improve on, but the numbers that it shows you, this 89 here, uh, the 20 there, and my view is a complete waste of time and people obsess about it far too much. So I'm going to look at how we actually can do this or how we can look at this differently on what actual user experience are going to get. So the first thing I'm going to look at is this uh, site here. So the elementor.com slash four slash designers. And we've got a fair bit of content here. We've got uh, moving parts, all sorts of stuff going on here. And it's not over the top, but it's a fair bit going on. So let's bring up our Chrome DevTools first. And the first thing I'm going to go to is the application tab. I'll just show you that currently in here, if I look at my local storage, I've got some bits and pieces in there, I've got some Hotjar stuff in there. Uh, if I go to my session storage, I've got not much in there just yet, but as I browse around, I'll get some stuff in there. Cookies, we've got a bunch of cookies here from all the different... Uh, from Elementor and Facebook and Hotjar and all sorts of stuff here. Uh, and then we've got some Hotjar stuff which we haven't actually recorded yet. To get a realistic view of what a first visit to this website is going to look like, we want to clear all this out. To do that, we'll click on these three dots over here, click on run command and just type the word clear. And the third option down here which it says clear site data including third party cookies. If I click on that, and then go back and have a look in the local storage here, all my cookies are gone. So I've completely cleared it out for this page. Okay, so that's the first thing we do. We then want to go over to our network tab, and we want to make sure we've got disable cache checked, because we want to check what we're actually getting from the internet, not what we're getting from our local storage. I'm going to start with no throttling here, but I'll explain that. Um, now, the other thing is that when we look at these page speed insights, typically our desktop performances aren't too bad. I mean, this is one below 90. If it was one point higher, it'd be green and people will be laughing and saying how great it is. But if it's one point lower at 89, everyone's panicking going, my site's not good enough. Please don't do that because this is a complete and utter waste of time trying to get this uh, up there. Right, the biggest concern is the mobile where it gives you a really poor score. There's lots of things you can do with this. There's a lot of caching plugins that uh, will fool these tools into thinking that it's faster than it is because it serves different content. Uh, there's uh, simplification of your content, get rid of animations, get rid of uh, uh, transparencies, get rid of you know, additional images that you don't need, keep your sites really, really simple, maybe a simple logo, a few headers, and some text, and you're going to get up near 100% in here, no problem at all. This is not realistic. I really want to, really want to accentuate that this is not a realistic way of viewing your website and your performance of your website, and Google do not even factor this. They've made it categorically clear that this is not a factor in their ranking. Their factor in their ranking, if which is related to this, is Core Web Vitals, which is what your browsers actually experience. So let's have a look at that. Over the web design, uh, we 
Now I want to um, set up some throttling. Now I've actually set one up here and I'm going to show you that. So I set mine up on 8 slash 15, uh, 8 slash 5. So I'm going to look at the where I set that. So under the settings, whoops, under the settings, we go into our throttling. I've got two that I've created here as custom profiles. I've got one 8 megabits per second down by 5 up. Now that is slower than any mobile we have in Australia. The LTE standard for mobiles is around about minimum 15 down by 10 up. So if you wanted a realistic view, you'd probably use the 15 by 10. The reason I've created an 8 by 10 is because it would actually give me a good indication on a slow mobile network on what it's going to take if the page size is larger. Bit of clarity here. When you look at a, say for example, you've got a JPEG image or a PNG image on your page, and it might be one megabyte. One megabyte is eight megabits. Okay, so one megabyte, if we've got an eight megabit per second connection, one megabyte will download in one second. So it's really important. Let's say you've got a three megabyte site. So you've got a site where you've got lots of images, some JavaScript, some CSS, and it's three megabytes in size. On this setting, I would expect that to take three seconds to download. So that gives me a good indication. So I'm looking at the slow end of what mobiles would likely to be, and then it'll give me an indication based on your size of your page, how slow this is actually going to be on a mobile. So the other thing I've installed up here, you might see a little green up here, is the Chrome Web Vitals plugin. You should get that because it gives you a lot of information. So let's go back over to our network tab. I'm going to click on the All button here. So I'm only filtering by, I'm not filtering at all, I want everything to come up in my uh, list here. I'm going to press the Control F5 key and watch what happens here. Okay, so I've got lots of things happening in the background. Pull this up so we can see more. There's still stuff loading yet. Down here, it's showing that our DOM content loaded in one second, 1.04 seconds, fully loaded in 1.4 a second. So fully loaded means that the initial JavaScripts that were in the... Uh, so what that means is the JavaScripts that ran when the document is ready have finished running at 1.48 seconds. Now there could also be some asynchronous stuff happening in the background. Uh, if we look here, we actually downloaded 5.7 megabytes of data, which decompressed to 6.6 .6 megabytes. Okay, so the actual finish time of doing all that was 12 seconds. What we're looking at really is this number here, is our important number that our web vitals are going to look at. If I have a look at the web vitals that are recorded, it's telling me the total time on this for the largest Contentful Paint is 1.74 seconds, which is a little bit on the high side. Now that is because of the, once it gets all the data, it's then got to render that on the screen. So it's the time that it took to load, plus the time that it took to render. I'm just going to do a Control F5 again. And this time we've got DOM content loaded in 0.7 seconds, fully loaded in 1.34 seconds. If we have a look at our web vitals, in this case, it took 1.34 seconds. So that's pretty close to the fully loaded time. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to drop my throttling by setting it to the 8x5. So my I'm throttling my connection to 8 megabits per second or 1 megabyte per second. I'm going to do my Control F5 again. And you see in this case, DOM content loaded was two seconds, it's still loading, really, really slowly. The reason for that is that there's a lot of lazy loading happening in the background, so the actual stuff you need to view the screen here, I'll do a Control F5 again. Okay. So the stuff you need to see the screen, the first paint of the screen, is already loaded in the background it's loading all this other stuff down here. Okay, so that's why there's a difference there. So even at um, 8 megabits per second, 
I've got a 2.2 second fully loaded time. But again, 2.2 second fully loaded time. So I'm throttling to what I would think the lowest mobile speed is likely to be here. I've got no caching on, and I'm still getting a fully loaded time of 2.2 seconds. Let's have a look at what PageSpeed Insight says. It tells me my first contentful paint is 3.8 seconds. So in here, it's telling me the it was blocked for 2.4 seconds. Uh, you know, the first contentful paint was uh, 8.4 seconds. Uh, over here, if I look at my web vitals here, I get 2.5 seconds. It took that time uh, because of the uh, extra loading. Up here, it's telling me 3.8 seconds. Let's do that again. Okay, so it's fully loaded. This was slower that time, uh, and that could be through internet variability, could be many things. This time, it's telling me it's 2.3 seconds. Trolley 5 again. This time, it's telling me it's 2.1 seconds. So what exactly is PageSpeed Insights measuring? What is, they're saying slow 4G throttling, which is, look, that's uh, 1.6 kilobits per second. Really? I don't know anyone who would have an internet speed that slow on their mobile. That is just a ridiculous number. So I think this is an absolute load of rubbish. So. If you want to get a really, really high score in here on your mobile, you need to make sure that this is really, really low number on uh, throttling of what they're saying is one point, sorry, what are they saying here? It is uh, 1638.4, okay? I'm actually gonna simulate that. I'm gonna try that. One, 1638.4 kilobits per second. I'm going to create a profile in here. Add a new one. I'm going to call that PSI Mobile. That's in kilobits per second. So again, that was uh, 1638.4. 1638.4 kilobits per second. It doesn't matter really what the upload is. Let's just make it the same. Okay, add that. Now let's set our throttling to the PSI mobile and do a control F5 again. Still waiting. Okay, so that's telling me my load time was 15 seconds. And it's still transferring all the stuff in the background. If I have a look at my web vitals here, it's telling me it's a 7.8 second load time, which is pretty much up where, uh, where are we? This is here, somewhere around the 8.5, largest contentful paint. So that's why we're getting these really, really low scores. So effectively, to get this number up here, what is presented to PageSpeed Insights needs to be an extremely small file size. So you're, you need to have a very simple page or you need to not load anything that is going to contribute to your page size when PSI does its scan. Now there's a couple of things that happen with that. There's some plugins which basically simplify the uh, what they what they present to PageSpeed Insights. So uh, things that come to mind is that when they detect it's being measured by PageSpeed Insights, it serves a very very low quality small file size of the images. Um, so PSI thinks everything's really really fast. The other thing it does is delay the uh, JavaScript execution, uh, which um, uh, I use WP Rocket, it has that feature. I tend not to use it because even though it gives you a great page speed insight score, what it's actually doing is it's preventing any of these JavaScripts, except for the ones you exclude, from running until the user interacts with your page. So moves their mouse or scrolls or clicks. 
So what happens, let's say, for example, you've got a slider up here in the header or background image that's moving or some animations. When the user first visits your page, it's just static. It doesn't move at all until they move their mouse over it or click. And it's quite, for me, I think it's quite off-putting. PageSpeed Insights thinks everything's amazing and really fast because none of those JavaScripts are actually running because PageSpeed Insights does not interact with the uh, page. So I think what they're actually rating you on is not what your real users are experiencing, which to me makes this tool a complete waste of time. I can't iterate enough how trying to get 100% on mobile, on PSI, is an absolute complete waste of time. Uh, unless you've got a really, really simple site, simple image at the top, simple logos, simple text, maybe a some small images in the header, whatever, then you can get this up there without having a full PSI. In my view, having to full PSI to get the score up is a complete waste of time because PSI is not a ranking factor. All right, so enough of that. So let's look at what we can actually measure. I'm gonna take this back to what is realistic, which is the eight by five, which is gonna be the slowest speed that we could probably experience, possibly experience. So heading over to my network tab, got a little uh, exclamation here because I'm throttled. So if I look at all on here, I can see, I'm just gonna do a F5. Okay, so this little chart that you see above the uh, list of elements that are being loaded or assets that are being loaded is really, really cool. So if I just click in here, I get a slider and I can move uh, either side or if I move into the middle of it, I get a hand. And what, uh, as I move my mouse, see everything down below changing? What that's showing me is what is actually loaded at this point in time. So what I'm seeing here is this blue here, which is my DOM content loaded. So at 800 milliseconds or 0.8 seconds, my DOM content is loaded. So all of the JavaScripts that I need, uh, all of the CSS that I need is ready to render the DOM. So I'm ready to go at that point. So when I get to this red bit here, that is my fully loaded time, which is when all of the JavaScripts have run, uh, CSS has been rendered, and the initial JavaScripts that are listening to the document ready uh, have run, and we should be seeing on the page pretty much uh, a page that's ready for the viewer. Okay, at that point, that's what happens. Now, if we look further along, uh, we'll see some more stuff up here. I'm just going to maybe push that along a bit. And we see over here, we've got another document ready. Now, why have we got another document ready there? Let's head over and filter this by our documents. Let's see what actual documents are loaded there. So at this point here, at the beginning, we're seeing the designer document, which is this page. If I grab that mouse and move it along, I've got some utils, which is part of Chrome. Move along, move along. What have I got there? Hotjar. So my Hotjar document started to load there. Move along there. Facebook. So what's happening at this point is Facebook's loading at this blue marker here, which might be hard to see because it's very tight, is the DOM content loaded for what we got from Facebook. And this here is the fully loaded time from Facebook. What we're really interested in is the first one. So this back here is our designer. When did that load? So what happened with uh, this document loading? Those. All right. Let's head back to the... Uh, Da, da, da. So uh, after the all, I'm going to skip the fetch slash XHR slash Ajax tab for now. And I'm going to come back to that because there's a lot of information there. So have a look at what JavaScript's loaded. So this is really good when you're, uh, let's say you're running a optimization plugin like WP Rocket and you're deferring or delaying JavaScript execution. And when you do that, something on your page doesn't work. In my experience, I use the Crocobot plugins and pretty much none of their uh, widgets seem to work when you delay JavaScript execution. So even though the user interacts with the page and the execution of those scripts should run, 
uh, for some reason, their code just does not work. So what I need to do is I'll disable the delay JavaScript execution. I will look through this list and go, okay, what JavaScripts am I actually loading? And then uh, I will exclude those uh, from the um, delayed execution to work out what's going on. So let's say, for example, we look at this one here. We find that's under the plugins, uh, Elementor Network. So let's say this was um, causing a problem. I would grab this path here, this, the forward slash Elementor dash network slash. I'd copy that and I would stick that into my exclusions for delay JavaScript execution. And that's going to uh, exclude anything that's under that path. So any of these JavaScripts that are under there. So if it's broken, this is a way to do it. You disable it. Look at what JavaScripts are loading. Look at where they're coming from. Try disabling the path. That will tell you whether that's fixed the problem or not. If there's a lot of JavaScripts under there, you might go further down and you might go, okay, I just want to actually just uh, exclude this particular file. So you'd copy that and stick it into your exclusions if you only want to exclude that one file. In my example of using the Crockerblock uh, plugins, uh, quite often there's only one or two JavaScript files that are in that path, so I just exclude the path and that works for me. So jet tabs, I do slash jet dash tab slash and then the tabs will work for me. Uh, now the uh, CSS, same deal. You can see all the CSS here um, that's loaded. Uh, and on both of these, you can actually see, like if I go back to the JS, I want to see what the sizes are. So I can click on this column here and I can sort by size. And there we go, that's the, uh, my largest one is 81K, which is this uh, OT banner. Let's have a look what that is. So that's actually come from a request uh, from an external URL. Look at the response. Okay, so this is called one trust banner. So I'm gonna pull that up and I'm gonna go, what is that? And I'm gonna search for that. Cookie banner one trust. There we go. So we know that script is associated with these cookie consent pop-up uh, banners. So that's one way of finding out what's going on. So you can get a lot of information from these just by clicking on them, having a look at the response. What do we get back from there? Sometimes you can tell, sometimes you can't. You know, this is a marketing thing from Elementor, uh, Rocket Loader. So this came from a Cloudflare uh, repository. Okay, so that's our uh, JavaScript and CSS uh, images. This is a great one for working out why these numbers are so high. So I'm going to do a control F5 here because I know we had a lot more size here than what we've got now. Okay, and I'm going to sort by size here. And I can see I've got a 663K image there. That is huge, even though it's a WebP, that's a huge image. And I've actually looked at this before. I'm gonna show you this image by click, right clicking on it and opening it up in the sources tab. And I'm gonna just click on it once to show me the size image. And this is actually a PNG, 24 bit PNG with transparency in the background. Now, when I've opened this up in Photoshop, I can see that these are not actually a solid color. There's a whole bunch of little dots in there, which has probably been created when they created the PNG. So this is gonna be a hard one to optimize. I think with Elementor, when you look at where this is used on the page, down here, there it is there. It doesn't need transparency. If they just made the background this solid color, they could have saved this as a high quality JPEG and they would not have had a 600K image. It's probably been more like, you know, yeah, two or 300K, uh, which majorly reduces the download size uh, and would look pretty much the same, I believe. Uh, they don't need transparency because there's nothing in the background that needs to show through. So that's something I think they possibly could have done better with this particular uh, page. Okay, so let's go back to our dev tools. And what else have we got? Uh, Control F5. Oops, I didn't do it. Control F5. So I do a Control F5. Sort by size. You have to click it twice so you can go backwards. 
a 240k image, which is this website mockups. So let's have a look at that. That's a PNG as well. Oops, didn't want to do that. Open that in a new. Actually, I do want to do that. So open that in, uh, reveal that in the sources panel. And it can see here, it's got transparency. So it's a 24 bit PNG with transparency. Let's see where that is on the actual page. There it is there. So they could have actually created this image as a JPEG and used this peachy background instead of having that with transparency. Maybe they created this before they decided what color of background they were gonna have. But I'm gonna have a look at this and show you why that's important. So let's have a, let's go back to my Chrome DevTools. Find that image again. Is there? I'm going to open that in a new tab. Download it. Just do my downloads. Open this up in Photoshop. So there it is. There. If I do a Control Alt Shift S, the old way of saving in Photoshop, which is still my preferred way, and I change this to a let's go high quality JPEG. Right, that still looks pretty good. Even if we went to very high, which makes virtually no difference to the quality of this, instead of having a 260K image, we would have a 75K image. So if I made that background a peachy color, save this as a high quality JPEG instead, uh, and put that in the website, um, I would have reduced this from 246K down to 75k. So that's a way of, uh, uh, of optimizing the page and reducing this download size here, which then will increase our performance on a mobile. Okay, so that's looking at the image tab. Media, that's just your videos that are downloading. I wouldn't worry too much about that because they generally load uh, in the background. Fonts, now here's an interesting one where with Elementor where they're getting some of these fonts from their, from their website. So it's under your WP content uploads. So these first fonts where we've got names on them coming directly from their website. Then they've got a bunch here that are coming from Google fonts. So this is kind of being discouraged at the moment um, in favor of downloading the Google fonts, putting them in as uh, custom fonts in Elementor and serving them locally like they have with these. That's kind of been discouraged. Uh, you can actually have a look at the preview of these fonts and see what are those fonts. So where, where you see them on the page, click on those and have a look at what those fonts actually are. So this is pretty cool. All right. So you can determine, like, for example, if you do upload your custom fonts, um, you're not sure whether there's still some fonts on your site that are downloading from Google. Uh, you can go to your page, do a control F5, have a look at these fonts and see where they're coming from. And in this case, you can see that they're from fonts.gstatic.com. And these ones are coming from elemental.com, which would be their domain because if we're on elemental.com up here. So that's those. Uh, documents. So if I do a control F5 on that, I get my designer document, which is the uh, page for this. So that's the HTML documents. So I right click and view the page source. That's this document here that we're looking talking about. In this case, it took 118 milliseconds, which is pretty reasonable. Uh, we then got some Hotjar documents. Uh, this is a built-in tool that I've got, and we got a Facebook document that got loaded. And this is the timing again that took for that. Okay, so we can see what documents are actually loading uh, at this point. Uh, I won't worry about any of these. WebSockets is a specific uh, JavaScript technology. Um, for keeping chats open, all that sort of stuff. Um, you've got, um, uh, you know, this here, if you point your mouse over, it tells you WebAssembly, Manifest, uh, other. So there's a lot of stuff you can do in here. So let's go back to the All tab. We're gonna show you one more thing in here that we can tell from the, from the network uh, tab here. So by default, this protocol tab is not enabled. To get that enabled, you just right click anywhere on those top row, 
and you check the boxes that you want for what you want to actually show. So what's important about this, if you right click on that and you enable the protocol, this is a really important thing because this, what I'm looking for down here is when you're getting assets like CSS, JavaScript, uh, etc. What I want to see here is at least H2. So what that is, it's the, uh, it's the protocol your web server is using to serve up the assets. The old protocol is HTTP1, which is a slower protocol because it serves up all of the assets uh, in sequential order. So it, it'll get one asset, then get the next asset, and then get the next asset, and each, each one adds to your time. Uh, HTTP2 is a newer protocol which actually downloads the assets synchronously. So it'll send off requests for all the assets and downloads them all at the same time. It doesn't wait for one to complete before it downloads the next one. It downloads them all at the same time. The next protocol, current protocol, is HTTP3. Uh, some CDNs use that. With, like, for example, Cloudflare use HTTP3. Uh, Lightspeed server is capable of HTTP3 if it's set up properly. Uh, and also with HTTP3, on top of that protocol, it uses a much leaner transport. So the HTTP1 and HTTP2, they use a transport called TCP, which has a little bit of overhead, so it adds to the size a little bit. Uh, HTTP3 um, uses what they call UDP protocol, which is a lot leaner, so the amount of data that it has to transfer is less. So HTTP2 is good because it downloads assets asynchronously. HTTP3 is better because it downloads the assets asynchronously and it's a smaller file size that it needs to transfer. All right, now, one other thing I'm going to show you on this page is, so one last thing I would encourage when you're looking at your page speeds is use the device toolbar and put it in a mobile view. The reason I say that is that a lot of websites will serve up different images, different assets for mobiles. So if you want to see what this is actually going to perform like on a mobile, use your device toolbar, put it into a, select a mobile view. In this case, I've select the iPhone 12 Pro, back to your network tab, do your control F5, uh, sorry, uh, set your throttling to an eight megabit per second download speed. Uh, do a control F5. Okay. Now it's showing me here. It's happening. If I click on my web vitals up here, it's telling me it's a two second load time. Uh, there's some cumulative layout shift, which is a little bit too high. Uh, and I think I've noticed this on a mobile with some of these elemental pages. So I'm just going to do a control F5 again here. We see this layout shift here. What's happening is the, as I do a control F5 again, see we've got some delay. And then this comes in up here. Uh, on some of their pages, I've also noticed that for whatever reason, like we go to their home page. If I go back to the home page, Bring that up. Now, if I do a control F5 here, watch this title. Okay, that's fine now. Now, if I get rid of this here, the pop up, do a control F5, yeah, it jumps. So, bring that down to here, I'll do a control F5 and the content jumps. So that's layout shift. So what's happening is if the pop-up is there, it, the content doesn't jump. If the pop-up has already been acknowledged, then the content jumps. So that's something that Elemental need to fix on their side as well. All right, so that's a lot to go through. Uh, I hope that's been useful and uh, gives you a bit of insight into how you can use these tools for working out how well your page is loading, what kind of results you're getting with the um, actual results that your browser is going to report back to Google for core web vitals, how to find oversized uh, images and assets, 
Sorry, there is one other thing. The XHR, I said I'd come back to this. The reason for that is quite involved. So if I look at my XHR tab, I do a Control F5. Okay, XHR or fetch are pretty much um, what we refer to as AJAX requests. So fetch is using a built-in uh, browser standard now. There's actually a fetch API in browsers. Uh, XHR would be using a JavaScript library um, to do that. What's so cool about this browser here, if I want to see what was this XHR request, this could be one of your plugins or anything that is getting data and you're not sure what it's getting. So let's have a look at this one. So this XHR request for location goes to uh, the URL is, if I put my mouse here, it goes to geolocation.onetrust.com. If I click on that, it'll show me the headers. That is where it sent the request to. This is the method that it used. So it used a get method uh, and it got this response. Okay. Now the preview is a formatted view of what it got. So let's have a look at the response. That is the JSON object that it got as a response. We preview that, it formats it. So this is the data that we're going to get back, that we're going to use from that. Initiator. Now, most JavaScript is going to be minified and uh, uglified, uh, they call it. So we're not going to really be able to tell from these what the functions are. But if you scroll down to the bottom, uh, initiator, this is all anonymous, so that's not going to tell us anything. Let's go to, say, settings. Here we go. So in the settings, um, XHR request, we go to the initiator, look down here. We can see that this file, um, core main with this uh, unique uh, id.js, uh, which is part of uh, Elementor API, customerapp.com. So this is an API uh, from Elementor, is what initiated that request. So there would have been a JavaScript library that downloaded from here that would have called this XHR request. We go to current, have a look down here. It's the same thing, but it's came from, it came from a separate call from a, a tracking tokens current. So we can see where did this request come from? Which JavaScript library did that actually come from which initiated that request? And this is really good for troubleshooting if you're figuring out which one's causing the problem. So the network tab is extremely useful. I really encourage you to spend some time analyzing your sites, looking at this and working out what you can figure out from this.